All right, uh, just got a devotional to start out. I'll, I'll open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your faithfulness in our lives and bringing us here to your Sabbath day and where we can rest in you. We ask for your presence here as we fellowship and think on you as we enter into the Sabbath or spend time with you here. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite devotionals is Our High Calling. This one here is from December 25th. Just randomly opened, and this is the one I have underlined a whole bunch. It's called The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Ephesians 3.16 The themes of redemption were momentous themes, and only those who are spiritually minded can discern their depth and significance. It is our safety, our joy, to dwell upon the truths of the plan of salvation. Faith and prayer are necessary in order that we may behold the deep things of God. Our minds are so bound about by narrow ideas that we catch but limited views of the experience it is our privilege to have. Why is it that many who profess to have faith in Christ have no strength to stand against the temptations of the enemy? It is because they are not strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle prays that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. If we had this experience, we should know something of the cross of Calvary. We would know what it means to be partakers with Christ in his sufferings. The love of Christ would constrain us, and though we would not be able to explain how the love of Christ warmed our hearts, we would manifest his love in fervent devotion to his cause. Paul opens before the Ephesian church in the most comprehensive language the marvelous power and knowledge they might possess as sons of God and daughters of the Most High. It was theirs to be strengthened with might, to be rooted and grounded in love, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Jehovah Emmanuel, he in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, to be brought into sympathy with him, to possess him as the heart opens more and more, to receive his attributes, to know his love and power, to possess the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is the heritage of the sons of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says I, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. I'm going to read one more than I Found them, bounce off. April 28, evidence of sense or emotion. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Hebrews 10, 23. We've talked about this before, about, uh, or Theodore has mentioned, how we don't necessarily feel God being close to us, or we don't see the evidences of our faith, but Sometimes faith is just trusting based on our past experience with God, knowing that he will remain the same. It is our privilege as children of God to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. At times, the masterly power of temptation seems to tax our willpower to the uttermost, and to exercise faith seems utterly contrary to all the evidences of sense or emotion. But our will must be kept on God's side. We must believe that in Jesus Christ is everlasting strength and efficiency. Hour by hour we must hold our position triumphantly in God, strong in his strength. All things are possible to them that believe. Since God is working in you, you can safely set your face as a flint to do his will. And you may trust the Lord perfectly. You must make a daily personal consecration of all to God.
You must renew your covenant to, to be His holy and forever. Place no dependence upon changeable feelings, but plant your feet upon the sure platform of the promises of God. Thou hast said, I believe the promise. This is an intelligent faith. Your feelings will be troubled as you see some pursuing a course contrary to the principles of Christ. Trials and tests of faith will come to you, but I entreat you to look only to Jesus and allow none of these things to harden your heart or to cause darkness or unbelief. Let nothing cause your faith to fail. Live as in the sight of God. Talk with Jesus as you would speak with a friend. He is ready to help you in the sorest trial. He is with you in the gravest perplexity. A feeling of assurance is not to be despised. We should praise God for it. But when your feelings are depressed, do not think that God has changed. Praise him just as much, because you trust in his word and not in feelings. You have covenanted to walk by faith, not to be controlled by feelings. Feelings vary with circumstances. Walk before God by faith and rest fully upon his promises. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Okay. And what we've been doing is studying the character of Christ in righteousness by faith on Friday nights. So here's one more, and then perhaps we can share. August 28, studying the character of Christ. Then shall I not be ashamed, when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Psalm 119, verse 6. In this world, we might become hopelessly perplexed, as the devil wants us to be, if we keep looking upon those things that are perplexing. For by dwelling upon them and talking of them, we become discouraged. In criticizing others because they fail to manifest love, we shall kill the precious plant of love in our own hearts. Have we individually appreciated and felt the warmth of love which Christ represented in his life? Then it is our duty to manifest this love to the world. Let us fear to dwell upon, to behold and talk of the great mistakes that others are making. You may create an unreal world in your own mind and picture an ideal church where the temptations of Satan no longer prompt to evil but perfection exists only in your imagination. The world is a fallen world, and the church is a place represented by a field in which grow tares and wheat. They are to grow together until the harvest. It is our place to... It, sorry. It is not our place to uproot the tares, according to human wisdom, lest under the suggestions of Satan the wheat may be rooted up. None need to lose the golden mo moments of time in their short life histories through seeking to weigh the imperfections of professed Christians. Not one of us has time to do this. We, if we see clearly what is the manner of character Christ, Christians should develop and yet see in others that which is inconsistent with this character, let us determine that we will firmly resist the enemy in his temptations to make us act in an inconsistent way and say, I will not make Christ ashamed of me. I will more earnestly study the character of Christ, in whom there was no imperfections, no selfishness, no spot, no stain of evil, who lived not to please and glorify himself, but to glorify God, and those inconsistent Christians and the mistakes that they have made shall not lead me to be like them. I will turn to the precious Savior that I may be like him. Kind of a timely reading, uh, cons considering the time, time we're in in this world and in the movement as well. There's been so much division, everyone pressing for their point to be made, everyone wanting to be right and prove that they are right and the others are not right. It's the wrong focus from what I'm getting. It seems to be that we need to focus on Christ and Christ alone and our own relationship with him and where we're at and being like him. 
is the danger that's mentioned here is um, it will kill the love in our own hearts if we if we focus on their imperfections and shortcomings it's not not uh, wrong to note them we need we need to know where we're at with everyone but at the same time we're not to dwell on it so any thoughts on that idea I'm a veritable rookie at this is this beneficial to you guys okay one more here July 26 holier yea holier still I have a note here our sanctification as God's object in all his dealings with us for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3. Our sanctification is God's object in all his dealings with us. He has chosen us from eternity that we might be holy. Christ gave himself for our redemption, and that through faith in his power to save from sin, we might be made complete in him. As Christians, we have pledged ourselves to fulfill the responsibilities resting on us, and to show to the world that we have a close connection with God. Thus, through the good words and works of his disciples, Christ is to be represented and honored. God expects of us perfect obedience to his law. This law is the echo of his voice, saying to us, Holier, yea, holier still, desire after the fullness of the grace of Christ, yea, long hunger and thirst after righteousness. The promise is, ye shall be filled. Let your heart be filled with a longing for this righteousness. God has plainly stated that he expects us to be perfect, and because he expects us, he has made provision for us to be partakers of the divine nature. Only thus can we gain success in striving for eternal life. The power is given by Christ, as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 12. God's people are to reflect to the world the bright rays of his glory. But in order for them to do this, they must stand where these rays can fall on them. They must cooperate with God. The heart must be cleansed of all that leads to wrong. The word of God must be read and studied with an earnest desire to gain from it spiritual power. The bread of heaven must be eaten and assimilated, becoming part of the life. Thus we gain eternal life. Thus is answered the prayer of Christ. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John seventeen seventeen. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Is it your will that your desires and inclinations shall be brought into harmony with the divine mind. This is related. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What is sanctification? Is it to give oneself... Is... Sorry, sorry. It is to give oneself wholly and without reserve, soul, body, and spirit, to God, to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God to know and to do the will of God without regard to self or self-interest, to be heavenly-minded, pure, unselfish, holy, and without spot or stain. It is through the truth, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are to be sanctified, transformed into the likeness of Christ. And in order for this change to be wrought in us, there must be an unconditional, wholehearted acceptance of the truth, an unreserved surrender of the soul to its transforming power. Our characters are by nature warped and perverted. Through the lack of proper development, they are wanting in symmetry. With some excellent qualities are united objectionable traits. And through long indulgence, wrong tendencies become second nature. And many persons cling tenaciously to their peculiarities. Even after they profess to accept the truth, to yield your, themselves to Christ, the same old habits are indulged. The same self-esteem is manifested. The same false notions entertained. 
Although such ones claim to be converted, it is evident they have not yielded themselves to the transforming power of the truth. If the one who is thus misrepresenting Christ could know what harm has been wrought by the faults of character which he has excused and cherished, he would be filled with horror. Let none feel that their way needs no changing. None can walk safely unless they are distrustful of self and constantly looking to the word of God, studying it with willing heart to see their own errors and to learn the will of God, Christ, and praying that it may be done in and by and through them. They show that their confidence is not in themselves, but in Christ. They hold the truth as a sacred treasure, able to sanctify and refine, and they are constantly seeking to bring their words and ways into harmony with its principles. This has actually been something that I've thought about. I always think about this, actually. How are my actions affecting other people in their walk with God, or whether they even would come to Him? I have, and, and, and looking back, you know, I've 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 been stubborn in holding on to my own character defects or acting in certain ways, and holding on to old habits and professing the truth or knowing it, but really not allowing it to have its effect on my life. Though I can't say, I won't say that I've done that always. I, I mean, of course, uh, there's been times in my life where it's become crystal clear what my defects of character are. And, and I, I do have that sense of fear. Like, how, who can save this guy? I mean, I'm just a train wreck, and I'm a rebel, and God has never left me. I've left him and tried to walk in my own ways, and it's never worked out, of course. Our characters, by nature, are warped and perverted. Not an easy thing to see, and often we don't see it until God allows the consequences, the fruit of our own ways. That's where it's so important not to depend on those feelings, not to give too much power to them, to guide our decisions and choices. Because uh, when we see ourselves for who we really are in the light of Christ's perfect character, we will despair. We will sink down in discouragement, lay in bed all day and cry and not want to do nothing. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. But, but Christ and faith, based on the word of God, he has promised, so it is true. And then to step forward in that, to take action, actually, on that faith, on that belief that he's still going to guide us as we're becoming aware of our defects and repenting of them, feeling sorrow for them. Like I've, I, I think of the lives and, that have crossed my path, and my prayer has always been that I could be a blessing and not a curse to people. It doesn't always work out, but when it doesn't, it might not happen right away. But I become convicted, and, and, and I'm sorry, and I'm, if it has to be me to be the first one to go to that person or situation and return to it and, and just confess my, my wrong and not worry about whether they're going to also do the same. There's something about Christ that he's done that by coming to save us who had no right except as to be provided by him. Um, we've been think, talking about these things as well, I think. Something here about living our lives and how we affect other people. I've been a curse, you know, in, in the lives of people. 
my look back and how my selfishness or stubbornness has caused me to stand in my own selfish choices. And that's not an easy thing to deal with. With People can't deal with that without God, without his forgiveness and assurance that he loves us no matter what. And I think we must have this experience if we are to be able to love God and others. Because first, to be able to love God, we have to see what he's done for for us, not only see it, but see it in a practical sense in our life, where we have fallen short. Does anyone have anything? Yeah, I'm thinking of Psalm 139, 14 through 16, and 23 and 24. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So tonight I was thinking it's not just God being aware of how we're formed in in our mother's uteruses. He sees our potential and he wants to bring it to its finest and its fullest, fullest, and we need to cooperate with him. And that's the challenge. And also there are many flaws and sins that we're not even aware of. And that's why we say, you know, search me, O God, and know him. You have to remove them, Lord. It's all you. Sanctification is just total reliance on Christ and becoming Christ-like. Well, that's how I see it, day by day. Thanks, Angela. I bring up something that's uh, you bring up something that's an important thing for us to consider as well. Sanctification and how does it work? Justification yeah, definitely yeah. all of God. Sanctification mm-hmm. is is a cooperation between the human and the divine. I think does that, and there's probably so, a lot. There is a lot more to it, but let's talk about that a little bit. Sanctification and the practical application of God's word to our lives. You want to try on that one, Angela? Uh, applying God's word to our lives, yeah, definitely. Because if I was to run by my own in- impulses, there'd be even a worse mess here than I've made in the past. So He reigns me in a lot. Not my will, but mm-hmm. Thine be done. You know? Remember that experience I shared about uh, someone coming to me and telling me not to be as the donkey or the mule that needs a <laughs> bit and bridle on its mouth? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been a donkey. And God has been faithful to pull back on that bridle and guide me, you know. It hurts, but it, we can be grateful after we look back. Maybe not in the middle of it because it's a fiery trial or whatever and it hurts. It hurts us to see our own problems with God and other people and not look at their problem causing my problem, but be able to look inward and see what part am I playing? How can I be more gracious? That that word gracious is big for me because it means like not taking offense, not not re, uh, returning the hurt in kind to someone that has hurt us hurt me that uh, that is God's work in my heart to, to sanctify me see my own in defects character defects and then having seen them knowing that God is the only answer to change that I mean we have to choose put our will on his side and allow him because our hearts can sure resist that love I describe God's love in my life like the the waves on the shore of the waves of the ocean on the shores of our my heart. They keep he, His love keeps coming, and breaks on the shores of my heart, and it overwhelms me. It just impresses me that yes, God loves me, and I I'm I'm repentant and sorrowful 
for the way I've been. And, and then I rise up again on my feet and I push back those waves of love, God's love. But like the ocean, God is lo- God's love is like that. It just comes back and keeps trying. He never gives up until there is n- no hope. And I believe as long as there is breath, there is hope. I believe this for myself. I believe this for everybody. So when we look at people that, man, they're just so far gone, I think there's still hope. But we know the unpardonable sin, but we don't know when anyone has done it. I think even ourselves may be unaware, because if we have committed the unpardonable sin, I don't think we would care. So. That's right. Hmm? Yeah, I'm saying that's right, because I'm thinking back when I had just done some terrible sin, and I thought, oh, I really lost it. I am lost. There's no redemption for this. But I, I went into mourning, like I was chopping my hair off, and I just felt so depressed. And I thought, if I weren't aware of how far off I am, if I didn't feel this guilt, then I, I would have sinned beyond redemption, so to speak. So I just ask the Lord to cleanse me, forgive me, and help me never to do that thing again. And it was amazing. Yeah, so it's holding true in your experience. You know, the dark places that we can go sometimes and leave us so hopeless. But God, uh, times when I've been there, people, God, God has brought people across my path to encourage me, you know. Just out of the blue, I might be in a bar or doing some other illegal thing or and then when it's done God comes to me in the ashes it's so good that way well then you got something what's the best thing that happened to us this year that we've seen God's hand in it or even within the last 12 months share a little bit about what I was experiencing last year my business I was running a fairly successful business making really good money and it seemed like God was just blessing me because I had nothing saved for my old age (laughs) (laughs) yeah we if we would have known we'd lived this long we would have saved more or whatever treated ourselves better but anyway the business was crashing and largely due to my own actions and the economy and COVID. But I'd lived in the city of Calgary for 18 years, and I'd been raised in cities, and I always wanted to live in the country, but never made the the practical step, you know, just all of the questions. How can I ever survive? How am I going to make money and support myself and so on? So I was thinking, you know, I've got to have this large amount of money to be able to do it. And one friend of mine kept telling me, just pray. God can provide and open that way and and then step through that door when he opens it. Well, I wasn't doing that. For 18 years, I kept thinking, I want to move out of the city. I know I have to be out of the city. It's better for me. I love being in the country, in the wilderness. And instead, to get me out of that city, God had to allow the consequences of my actions to come home. I uh, I ended up homeless. They raised my rent like almost a thousand dollars after being in the same place for 18 years. I, and stubborn me, I was like, I'm yeah, I am not going to do that. You know, just and uh, of course I got evicted and and I lived in my truck for six months. I have a three-ton truck with a big box, so not hard to do. But uh, I was homeless. I, I got to experience what it was like that so many are in that place now. And it created in me a lot of compassion, um, understanding, mm-hmm. no doubt. and a connection connection with them as, as individuals and human beings and, you know, how they how they are so kind and thoughtful but also devious <laughs> because I ended up getting m- m- so much stolen thousands and thousands and thousands and, and including my business computer and 
uh, last year of billing records, so I wasn't able to bill that out. And so I ended up uh, picking garbage from the cans and pop bottles and pop cans and to just get by. I'd be looking for cans in the, in the car wash, and, oh, they threw this box of cookies out. It's only half eaten. It doesn't smell bad. doesn't look bad. I'm eating it, and it. I had no problem doing it. But uh, to think that I was like that prodigal son that was eating with from the pigs, wanting what the pigs were eating, even. So it, I got I, God just allowed me to go right to the bottom of taking away all the conveniences. You know, I I, I was thinking when I was running the business that. I had all that my heart desired. All my wants were were were, were supplied. But then I I uh, I didn't know what to do with all that money. I invested some, which hasn't worked out, and spent lots. And I gave lots too because I like having money so that I can give money. Mm-hmm. So got to that point, and then. It had to, because I remember my last time praying in desperation to God. I was on my knees, just head down. I couldn't even lift my head. And and just my prayer was, I don't know what to do. 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 God help me. And I'm a guy that's pretty smart and always knows what to do. Give me time and I'll figure it out. But God had to bring me to the end of my own resources in in order to trust me to provide everything that I've wanted my whole life, which is to live in a wilderness setting. And it's not me. A friend just said, come out, come. And I'm here, and it's been the best thing I've ever done in my life. It's so quiet. Praise the Lord. And God, but God is healing, you know. It's been a tough row the last three years. Never thought I would have went to the places that I did. So that's the story of God's faithfulness in my life and being crushed in order to be lifted. I'm that guy in the picture. Is that Peter sinking in the waves? You know, and I just clung to mm-hmm. God, but he. He clung to me with a firmer gri- grasp than I could ever hold on to him. Yeah. Some random thoughts try to stimulate some other sharing, maybe. The greatest wrong we can do to others is to be unforgiving if we think they injure us in any way. This is a most dangerous position for a professed Christian, because just in the manner in which he treats his brethren, so will the Lord of heaven treat him. We need to have higher and more distinct views of the character of Christ. We do not think of God only as a judge and to forget him as a loving father. Nothing can do our souls greater harm than this, for our whole spiritual life is molded from our conceptions of God's character. That's why the study of God's character, the right study of it, matters so much our whole spiritual life how we think about god because the way we think about him is the way we will it it affects us we think of him as a stern stern judge then we will be but as we meditate upon the the way jesus has lived as a man and, and as god in our life it, it's a higher calling. It, it it raises us up to look at others as God looks at them. And I, I don't know how many times that that I've offended people, and they've they've like uh, gone away from me. They didn't want to be around me, of course. And uh, thinking, what did I just do? I I've I've cut off the connection that to me is so important to be able to share God with them. So that that makes me more careful. That's the most important thing to me is if I can be 
connected to somebody and help them to know God because knowing God's been the best thing in my life. I want that for everybody. Everybody. Amen. Theodore mentioned something the other day about Oh, hi, Jeff. Uh, good evening. Theodore mentioned something about uh, when, I, you know, knowing me so long. I mean, I, I've known, lived with the Turner family since 1976. And uh, he said that he had an advantage over me. And it's true. The Turner home was mm-hmm. the best thing in my life when taught me so much living there about how God is and uh, I was glad to be able to share in that privilege yeah it it made a big difference in my life and it's so neat because when I stopped to think and review that history I had to because I'm not good with all the events of my life tend to blur together and I'm not sure what time they happened so thinking back the night I was converted a friend of mine told me that I needed God and we had done all kinds of crazy stuff together and I'm like wow I hadn't heard from him for a year and he was now a Christian and I'm like okay and then we just kept talking and I said I haven't seen you for so long I'm in crisis I was getting kicked out of the house by my mom and stepdad mainly the stepdad didn't want us and I was like 16 17 I think and uh I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what what the heck am I going to do now? And I had to leave. And I I talked with my friend, and I said, I really need you right now. And he said three words that changed my life. Well, six. You don't, seven, actually. You don't need me. You need God. And that was totally foreign. We never talked about God. So now something was really different about him. When I got off the phone and went went to sleep that night, I'm laying in bed in the dark, and I look up into the darkness, and I say, God, if you're really real, I want to know more about you. And it was like instant. He, It was like, I describe it as a pulling the veil aside and looking at me and coming to me. Just the assurance, which we are not to despise those feelings of assurance, but not depend on them. So the feeling of assurance just came to me like a, like a, a, a being wrapped in a warm blanket and I was safe and I, everything was going to be okay. And I fell asleep peacefully, got up, went to school the next day. I'm talking with my friend, Stephen Turner, that's Theodore's older brother. He, we were friends and hung out together. I'm telling him what's going on. And he looks over at me and says, well, just come and live with me. Come and live at my house. I'm like, well, he hadn't asked his parents. He hadn't cleared it and all of these things. I'm like, yeah. I went home with him, and, of course, the Turners just welcomed me. And I lived with him till I, uh, for that next year of high school. And it saved my life, really. It changed me, but I was converted the day before I went to live in the Turner home. It was quite significant for me, quite a significant milestone or mark in the journey of my life. That's where kind of where it began. And in between then and now, I've been on the shore. God's love keeps coming back to me no matter. I've run so hard away. Like that year um, was good in high school. A lot of changes for the better. The drugs, the alcohol, everything just dropped away. I didn't. It wasn't even interested in it. And then the next year, I went to one of our Adventist universities, Canadian Union College at the time, CUC in Lacombe, Alberta, and uh, went there for my last year of grade 12. I went from failing classes to being on the dean's list and, you know, all these good, I was, it was a good education. And I was trying. Then I left, graduated, and thinking I'd go back to be a pastor, but I refused to get student loans, didn't want to get in debt and all this. So I didn't go back. I think God saved me from that, being a pastor. And uh, instead, I went back to the city, started associating with all my old friends, 
dealing drugs and partying and and uh, that there was this one night where I went out to a farm party and we have big big bonfire and we're going all night and then winds down to maybe three or four of us in my friend's van and see it's starting to get light outside and it's getting a little too smoky in the van so I'm like I gotta get some air step out and I see this guy lying on the ground over by the bonfire and there's another couple guys standing over him uh, and one of the girls that was with them so there's three guys standing over this guy laying on the ground and I walk over there and I say is he okay ah don't worry buddy he'll sleep he'll sleep it off and I look down he's not he's not sleeping he, he's he looks like someone that's dead I said I think he's dead and people say oh you were just hallucinating no I got down felt his chest I said he's not breathing don't worry about it and I tried then I tried mouth to mouth resuscitation my first day that I thankfully learned and uh, he wouldn't take breath he'd kind of start and then and he couldn't breathe and tried again and again and then he started breathing I remember crystal clear the thought was, wow, look what I'm doing. And then, and he stopped breathing. I looked up and the sun's just coming up over over the eastern horizon and that summer morning. And I said, God, no, please, I know it's you. I know it's you. Let him live. And I did again and resuscitated him. And then he started breathing and he got back to his normal breathing. And he couldn't get up. You know, and I'm like, hey, you guys, let's get him in the house. Finally, we did. They didn't really want to help. And I'm laying there, or he's sitting, laying on the couch, and there's other people still partying all night. And and I, uh, <clears throat> I uh, talked with him, and, um, just keeping him uh, calm. And, I, and when I looked up from that couch and I, into the room, it was like so very real that there was a lot of evil in that room. Like the devil was not happy with that I had just been part of taking a soul from his clutches. It was very real to me, like very real. And I and I just realized I I was out of energy. It, at that by that point and I just had to leave but I didn't want to leave him alone I wanted them to call an ambulance they wouldn't break up the party mm. so I tell him I gotta go and he panics and he tries to sit up and he's grabbing me and I'm like so I it's okay it's okay so I hug him I hug him and I lay him back down and I say I gotta go I don't know how how you're going to be. I hope you're going to be okay. But if you're not, I want you to know about God. So I told, you know, shared some with him. And then he got calm and, and relaxed and he laid back down. And, his, you know, I, it was time for me to go. And I, and I left, got back to the van with my friends and said, I got to go. And of course I had all the drugs. So they're glad to see me. And I, I said, no, no, I'm, I'm walking. And I just started walking and walking and walking. It was probably about a three-hour walk home from there. And uh remember the first thing I did when I got off that property was I took all the drugs that I had and I just threw them into the ditch. And then I got to a field and the sun's higher in the sky now and I stop in the middle of that field and I turn around and I look at the sun and it's, I felt like I was before the throne of God, really. It's... And I took all the money out of my pocket that I made and I put it on the ground and I said, God, please let somebody find this money that needs it. I got home and went to sleep. You think a guy would turn around at that point, but no, I got up the next day and went to my friends and where'd you do with all your drugs? Well, then we went looking for it in the ditch. <laughs> I don't know who ever found the money, but this to me is one of the experiences in my life where I was so close to God. I was going to a Christian school and you know, wanting to be a pastor. 
And then the next thing I know, I'm selling drugs and saving someone's life that's been at a crazy party. Like, what a contrast. So I thought that, you know, I went back actually the next day to see if that guy was okay. And the bonfire was kind of smoldering and I'm saying, well, where is he? Well, he got up and went home. I'm like, no way. He was beat up so bad. I, I just didn't believe him. I kind of wondered if he had died and they burned him in the fire. I My imagination was going crazy. Well, where does he live? And they they kind of knew. So I went to his place the next day. And his landlord said, no, he, he moved out. He, he's he gone. Went north to work. And I'm like, really? Somehow I thought the landlord was in on it too. And the, the guy died. I didn't know for years and years and years whether he died or not. And I always thought he had and thought of him once in a while. Didn't know his name. Didn't know anything other than just that little bit about where he had lived. And uh, I think it was 20 years later, 30, might have been 30. 20 years later, I'm telling this story, just like this, to some friends. And the guy jumps up from the couch and he says, That was me! You don't remember? That was me! (laughs) That was neat. That's the love of God in my life. Anyone else, please. You know, my friend Tom, he he had, I'd I'd shared, you know, crazy stories like this at Sabbath school one time. Tom was visiting. He wasn't he he wasn't a church guy, but he came with me. And uh, later he said, "Kelly, you can't talk like that about all that stuff. These people don't understand." <laughs> but uh, it didn't. I wasn't phased by or worried about what they would think about me because the, at the end of it all, I want them to know how good God is in all of this. And that's one of my sayings, you know, that no matter what, God loves us. And he'll try and save us. And will save us. But he'll let things happen in our lives to turn it around so that we become willing to cooperate with him. And often that does require the debasing of our pride. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was at the beginning of my Christian walk, kind of you know, running... <laughs> getting settled and then running and still figuring it out. But, uh, you know, I, I just don't stop holding on to God somehow. Somehow. So God can guide us, you know, still in, in our darkness. When we when we go off like the prodigal son or whatever, he's still there helping us somehow. I, mean, I just believe that. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. I believe that. We may not be able to be saved until we repent. But the whole time we're in that stubborn rebellion, he's still yearning over us, sending us little uh, sightings of his presence, seeing his hand, how he, that was you, God. I know that was you. Couldn't have worked out any other way. I know my story it gets really crazy at times and compared to say Theodore who's never done drugs or drank or something or many of you I'm sure have the same story perhaps and you know what is it the evangelists say you know you don't have to have a wild and crazy story to experience this love of God and to be able to see yourself as just as bad as the next guy, just because while we may not have done the worst things that others have done, there's there's that experience when God, when God, when we're in the presence of God, every person sees the contrast of their the pollution of their souls and minds, and so we can all have that experience of being uh, sorrowful for the choices or things that we've had in our life because we're all human. We're all fallen. It just doesn't have to be as dramatic or big or crazy, but I've had a lot of them. And so that's how, I, I guess, 
that's one of the things that gives me a lot of compassion and understanding and patience with others when they're in the middle of stuff and how I can keep believing for them and say, hey, you're not going too far. I'm so thankful. Well, we're... That's that's been an evening. Does anyone else have something to say? Anything about their thoughts and faith and relationship with God, even if it's just this week? Well, I'm just thankful that all the times that I've gone astray, He's had had His mercy and patience, which absolutely astounds me, and pulled me back on the right track. I uh, was able to. <clears throat> I was thinking about, now this is comparison, it's not judgment, but I'm listening in on, on some of the other study groups, and it it seems like it's so, uh, like I get anxious, not because of what they're saying, but how they're saying things, like constantly got to be talking about their point or bringing it around to see how they see it or some more adding to. I always got to add something else into the discussion. And it uh, cre- creates in me a anxiousness. And, I, and it sounds angry, like they're upset or something. There's constant speaking, speaking, speaking. And then you have this group. And I just... It's become so wonderful to me to join the studies because there's these long pauses and and it's comfortable in the stillness and the silence. We're not worried about saying something, filling the dead air with our voices. But (laughs) being able to, to... Isn't that true? The contrast? Yeah, I think so. In the multitude of words, there one does not sin, the Bible says. So. Amen. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't mind the silences, so I'll just be a little quiet again. And maybe maybe if anyone else has something to say before we uh, just close it up, well, I'll give that opportunity now. Well, if no one else is going to say anything, I have to add that the last couple of days, the Lord really did a miracle in my life. As I'm sharing a house with somebody that I had utterly despised. I mean, I hated her so much because of the way she is and because of the offenses against me and against others that I actually wished her dead. And I thought, well, that's murder and a murderer has an eternal life and I better repent of this. And I really pray that the Lord would remove that, that hatred and that bitterness toward her and it would help me instead of criticizing her, I mean, I didn't do it so much to her face, but when she, when she was around or when she wasn't around, I was thinking of everything that she was doing that was wrong and really, I mean, she is not a pleasant person at all, but but I, I know better, right? So I needed to take the higher ground. I said, Lord, please help me to intercede for this family, intercede for her especially. If there's any possibility of them coming to repentance and really coming to know you, Lord, Please help me to pray for them more than I'm criticizing them. And then a couple of days ago, she came to me and she told me about two people she knew who had babies. And one of them had to have surgery. I think really some serious stuff, serious health problems there. The second one is a newborn of a, of, of a drug addicted couple. And the mother was high all the time and wasn't even feeding her newborn. So by the time this person who's relating the story told me found out about it. I guess she's the one that called uh, family services. And she said, I felt bad because I don't, it's terrible when they have to apprehend a child, but this child, they, they had the, when they brought, brought the child to the hospital, uh, the staff there said that if they hadn't brought her in, the little one in, she probably would have been dead within 24 hours because she was literally starving to death and of course dehydrated as well. And she was shaking all the time. And I said, well, she's withdrawing from the drugs that the mother was taking. But why would it be taking so long to withdraw? And on top of being starving, I thought, well, her whole system is out of kilter because of, because of the way she's 
traumatized, you know. And so I had, I, you know, I was in the prayer meeting last night. So we had prayer for her, for this baby. I think her name is Amy. And the mom's, mom's name is Hannah. And I met Hannah a couple of years ago before she got involved with this guy and before she got so strung out. So I'm praying that her, her, her so-called boyfriend come to Christ and go into rehab and that they will be freed of this addiction. And that the child will actually wind up in a good foster home where she will be nourished back to health and really taken good care of, like preferably a Christian home. And, you know, like it's not the first time I've heard stories like this, you know. And then the second mom, she she, she looks like a biker chick, chick. Like I've never really had a chance to really talk to her, but I met her a couple of times. And I don't know what exactly is the matter with her child, but I know she takes care of her kid. So... There's so many people, damaged people out there that really need Christ in their lives, really need to learn to depend on him to a, for an absolute revolutionary change. Because we are not islands and whatever we do affects somebody else. And I was thinking, oh, I made a lot of mistakes as, as, as a parent. And thank God, once I started having children, I was away, like a long time away from the drug scene, at least a couple of years. And I never went back to it. And I never went back to a lot of things that I was doing prior to coming to Christ. And uh, I was a tough, really tough parent, but I always provided for my kids. I gave up a lot to provide for those kids. They had much more than I had in my childhood. You know, like they couldn't accuse me of going to bars and picking up guys. They couldn't accuse me of shooting up in front of them. They couldn't accuse me of a lot of things. They can accuse me of other things which are probably just as bad. But my thing was, I'm going to give my children what I didn't have in my in my life. My parents did not provide for, for us. I mean, I was half starved too, so I know what I you know. It just it was inconceivable to me. Like if a child, if a baby was crying at two o'clock in the morning or whatever, I would feed that child. You know, and I would be walking around, almost sleepwalking. Sometimes I would fall asleep because I was breast I breastfed all of them. And I'd be falling asleep, but that child was well taken care of. <laughs> and I it's just inconceivable to me that somebody who is so callous and so strung out and so selfish would not even give a baby a bottle or breastfeed, you know, not even take care of the basic needs. And I used to work in some homes like that. You now one woman I was working for and her husband First time I went there, everything seemed to be okay. They just needed needed some respite. Second time I went there was months and months later. The husband was furious. He was going to get his GED, so he would leave me alone with the kids. I think it was three times a week I was there for 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 uh, for half a day, and I would take care of these four little kids. And he would come back and he'd say, "I'm so angry with my wife because she got strung out on crack, and uh, she has left. She's abandoned this family." You know, and this is so common. It's a lot more common than we think. You know, and we, we need to be able to step in there with the love of Christ and the patience of Christ and have help this help these people to mend if we can. You know, he, there was one guy. There was there was a second guy I worked for, and he was furious at his wife too for the same reason. You know, drugs left the family to do her drugs. So I was showing him how to train the kids to be a real help around the house. And there was a four-year-old boy there. He was marvelous. He was doing things that you would think a 12-year-old would, would be doing. He was so helpful. Four years old. He reminded me of my kids because I trained them as soon as, as soon, basically as soon as they could walk to help around the house. Okay. Well, that's, thanks for sharing that, Angela. Okay. Well, uh, An Angela, would you close with, for, with prayer for us, please? So, Lord, we thank you so much for this, this preparation day and all that was accomplished today and for the Sabbath that's coming on. And we ask you, Lord, to be with us and help our minds to be stayed on thee and strengthen us, Lord, and help us to be aware of the things that are in this world and all the temptations, but not to yield to those temptations. Help us to go forth with healing power and to be there for our friends and those that you bring into our lives, Lord, because there there is a purpose. There's a reason why you bring certain people into our lives. And certain people like this person that I'm sharing with, 
has brought out some of the worst in me so I, I can deal with it. I can see I can see the old woman needs to be put to rest and and I need to be renewed in Christ and I need to keep being an example for her. So maybe she will see, even though I'm such a bad example at times, like she will see her need of Christ and will turn to you and will, will acknowledge where she's gone wrong and make amends to the huge list of people that she's offended. I hope that family, if there's any hope for them at all, to be rescued from the snare of the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen.